Thank you. And welcome to the Milken Institute's London Summit. We're delighted to be back in London for our fifth consecutive year. We have a very full and thought-provoking day of ideas and insights ahead of you. And I'd love to tell you more about the Milken Institute right now, but I'm gonna, we're going to save that for lunch. And at lunch, we'll tell you a little bit more about the work that we do and our mission of uh, broadening global prosperity by expanding access to capital, improving health, and enhancing job creation. Uh, we are able to do this because we are a, um, as a uh, nonprofit organization that's publicly supported, we're able to do this because of the support that's provided to us by our strategic partners and by we're listed here, and by our London Summit sponsors, and we want to thank each and all of them now, and we'll do that again later. For now, let me just give you some suggestions um, to help you make the most of your day. First, I strongly encourage you, if you haven't done so already, to download and use the MI Events app on your smartphone or your pad. With it, you're able to find panel times and rooms, connect with other attendees, find speakers, and be part of our social media. You'll see information about the app right up there. Now, as I said, this is our fifth London Summit, but it's our first year here in the uh, Grand Connaught Rooms. Uh, this is a wonderful facility because, as you'll find, uh, it has ample rooms for the type of schedule that we have with a number of breakouts and private sessions. Uh, but it is a somewhat complicated venue to find your way around. So to help you to do that, we're providing plentiful roadmaps and guides along the way. For one thing, we are providing you the At a Glance one pager that you all received. Uh, it's, uh, it has uh, all of the details that you need to show you how to move around the facility and where things are and the rooms are. But perhaps more importantly, uh, we have outside this room and throughout the halls, I think 722 of them, maybe a few less, um, we've got uh, not, we have individuals to help guide you along the way. Uh, just look for the event team badge and their bright blue and white scarf um, or tie not the blue and whatever color polka dot this is, but the ones you see up there. Uh, they'll provide you with a copy of the one pager if you need it, uh, and directions to help you get to where you want to go. Uh, there are lifts available for those of you who need it uh, in going to rooms that are on higher levels, uh, but uh, I think you'll find using the stairs will be much easier uh, in getting around the building. And then at the end of the breakout sessions, you'll see on the screens the next panels and how to get there. And you're also going to find signs posted throughout letting you know. I don't really think you'll have any difficulty, but we do want to make it as easy as possible. Now, let's get going on our first panel of the day, Global Overview. I'm delighted to introduce the moderator of this panel, Zanny Mitten Bedos. Zanny is the editor in chief of The Economist. She was named to that position last February. From 2007 to 2014, she was the magazine's economics editor, based in Washington, uh, where she led global economics coverage. Before joining the magazine, she was an economist at the International Monetary Fund and an advisor to Poland's finance minister. So please join me in welcoming Zanny Mitten Bedos, and our distinguished opening panel. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, good morning, everybody. We are going to uh, start this uh, incredibly interesting looking conference with uh, a global overview. And, um, I was, I'm trying my best to stay optimistic about the outlook for the world economy, uh, but I'm finding it quite hard. Okay. So I'm hoping that you will all convince me otherwise. But as I look around the world right now, um, I see increasingly grim signs on the economic side. 
Uh, I was just in China, which was a profoundly depressing experience. Um, uh, I think the rest of the emerging world isn't looking great either. Uh, and I know Willem has been, um, Willem Boiter, who we will hear from in a minute, has been sending emails around saying we're going to have a global recession next year. So he hasn't been making me feel much better. Uh, on the political side, we have enormous numbers of challenges too. On the geopolitical side, it's whether it's Syria, whether it's the South China Sea, whether it's concerns about the US's willingness to remain a superpower, uh, whether it is the refugee migration crisis in Europe, there's really not a lot of good news there. Um, and I think on a third dimension, we can also be a bit worried, which is the growing frustration on both sides of the Atlantic amongst many voters with the status quo, with established political parties, established political leaders, whether it's Marine Le Pen, whether it's Jeremy Corbyn, whether it's Donald Trump, whether it's Bernie Sanders, uh, there's an enormous frustration with, uh, with the status quo. And I think if I put those three together, uh, my generally sunny disposition uh, is finding it hard to stay positive. So I'm hoping that uh, this panel will convince me otherwise. It's an outstanding panel. Willem Boiter, on my left, your extreme right, chief economist of City. Paul Collier, senior fellow at the Milken Institute as of uh, a few days ago, but also professor at the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford. Larry Hathaway, group chief economist at GAM. And last but absolutely not least, Anna Palacio, a member of the Spanish Council of State and, of course, former foreign minister. Welcome, all of you. Um, let's, start, let's start with the most, uh, I think, probably the most downbeat person on this panel, but maybe you can change that, Willem. You are predicting, uh, with increasing frequency in your emails, for those of you who read them, that we are going to have a global growth recession next year and that things are looking far grimmer. And you sent, you were just in Lima, uh, and I got this email this morning from Willem, not me personally, but a large number of people. It was entitled Gloom But No Doom, and you felt somewhat upset, I think, that in Lima people were not as pessimistic as you were. Um, so tell us why you are so pessimistic uh, about the world economy, and what is it that makes you concerned about 2016? Well, first of all, seven years after the great financial crisis, Throughout the advanced world, so-called advanced world, I should say, uh, total non-financial sector debt, that is the GDP, is higher than it was before the crisis. Emerging markets have debt coming out of the rears too now, mostly private, corporate. Um, the growth model that has driven emerging markets, more than 50% of global GDP and well over 50% of global trade, is broken down. They have to move from of export-led growth to more domestic demand-led growth. In the case of China, they have to move massively from overinvestment on a scale not seen since Stalin to uh, domestic consumption uh, and services-driven growth. And um, all this has to happen um, while other emerging markets, are partly because of the slowdown in China and partly for domestic reasons, Brazil, Russia, South Africa are uh, in various degree of dire straits. Uh, the policy responses required to counter this require actions that should not be and are not beyond imagination, but certainly seem to be politically infeasible. Debt restructuring, I think, in most advanced economies, and combined monetary fiscal stimulus targeted uh, in uh, the case of, of, of China at consumption, funded through the central government, and monetized by the central bank. So people's helicopter money. Uh, it should be popular, but we seem to be incapable of delivering it. Supply-side reforms, of course, are desperately necessary uh, to ensure that the labor markets uh, don't just work for the insiders, mostly the old, but also give the outsiders, mostly the young, a chance. Um, the world is closing down, in a way, uh, retreating from globalization, uh, partly as a result of the dysfunctional aspects of globalization, because everything moves more easily, the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, but uh, we are at risk of losing the good aspects of globalization out of a fearful and panicky nationalistic and uh, splittist um, response to uh, the dysfunctional aspects of globalization. All right, I told you he was do doomy. Let's, um, 
let's, let's take that bit by bit, and I'm going to ask Larry to challenge you, because I hope Larry is a little bit less pessimistic. Just, Willem, just on China, because China, I think, is central to your gloom. You think that China's economy is doing much worse than many other people do? Oh, yeah, uh, but they are, <laughs> is, you know, way away from the official data. The official data are just for entertainment value, right? And it is astonishing to me to see the IMF actually taking these things at face value. This, this really undermines the credibility of the organization. Um, so it's slowing down for totally classical reasons. <laughs> Massive excess capacity as a result of wasting at least certain percent of GDP every year since 2008 in investment yielding no return. It is, they're growing at 7% now, you investing 45% of GDP, but if you're growing at 10, investing 32% of GDP. You can do the algebra. So there has to be a major shift towards consumption, and we're getting some of that. Yes, consumption is growing faster than CapEx, but just as well. Um, in, this, in addition to this massive excess capacity, there is excessive debt, especially in the corporate sector and the local government sector, and I would say policy ignorance about, uh, not about the long-term vision. That's pretty sound, you know. Take a, give or take a five-year plan, you can see the rebalancing happening but about the high-frequency financial stability issues and the counter-cyclical uh, you know, fiscal policies and monetary policies that are required. There is just, I think, a policy blank out there. So we're not seeing the response, and we won't see the response, I think, that's necessary until open unemployment starts rising, threatening social stability, and um, uh, no, putting into question the control of the, of the party. It's only then, and I think that there'll be some distance into what I would call a Chinese recession, uh, to growth uh, sort of about 2.5% on the official data, maybe 45 5%. All right, let's take... Uh, Larry, can you, can you answer or, or, or counter, perhaps, uh, broadly Willem's overall pessimism, but particularly on China. Are you, I mean, it's interesting that he says uh, the Chinese are unwilling, they're policy ignorance. I mean, uh, normally the sort of standard view is that Chinese policymakers are actually extremely adept and have steered this economy remarkably well for many years. So are you as pessimistic about China and are you as pessimistic about the world economy? Well, I'll come back to the world economy where perhaps I'll, I'll uh, share a, a slightly more, let's say, balanced or divergent view from, from that of Willem. I, unfortunately, I think when it comes to China and maybe when it comes to other parts of EM, it is actually hard to be particularly optimistic. I think uh, China has clearly been slowing for some time now. Willem is right that the official s statistics betray what is really going on. Surely growth is lower than the headline figures would suggest and has been actually for some time now. There's no great insight there. And the main challenge that the Chinese policymakers are confronted with is how to confront the slowdown without resorting to things that are leading to the big imbalances in the economy, the excessive investment, particularly in property, the ex excessive amount of credit creation. And those things, I'm afraid, will be long-term concerns for us. This is not something that can be addressed uh, in a matter of quarters, much less even perhaps years. It's going to be a challenge that will confront us certainly through the remainder of this decade, if not beyond. But if you'll permit me, coming back to where perhaps <coughs> things are not quite so gloomy, um, when I was uh, younger, kind of wet behind the ears as an economist, as it were, this now must be decades ago, uh, we used to measure world output by looking principally at the United States, at Western Europe, and Japan. And there I think there are some grounds to be a bit more uh, constructive. In all uh, of those regions, you see major economies, the U.S. Uh, in the broad European context, so I'll include the U.K. and focus on Germany, and, and also in Japan, you have now economies that have restored themselves to fuller cyclical uh, levels of employment. They, they have structural unemployment problems, which Willem correctly pointed out in terms of things like youth unemployment and those for whom perhaps the economy has moved on and for, for whom uh, they don't have the skills requisite to get a job. But those fuller levels of employment are, I think, very slowly and we're right at inflection points, going to lead toward at least one thing that will be a healing factor, both economically and politically, and that is an adjustment, a necessary adjustment between the return on capital and the return on labor. Um, we are beginning to see signs of wage inflation here in the United Kingdom. 
Uh, there are many more openings now than there are applicants for jobs in Japan uh, as well as in the United States. Early signs that we're seeing that tightness appear that I think will restore that sense of more and equal distribution of income, which as I said before, I think will have economic benefits conferring greater stability on the, uh, on the expansion, but also will have political benefits, uh, alluding back to your comments about populism. That, that's interesting. We'll get to that. It's also going to complicate, if you're right, it will complicate the outlook for central banks too. Certainly will. I Anna, I want to get to the politics of this in just one second, but first I'm going to finish with the emerging market side of things. And Paul, you, are, you know more about low-income countries than practically anyone on the planet. Uh, the the um, environment, if Willem is right, and indeed Larry, and China is really slowing, we're seeing <clears throat> it in commodity prices, uh, we have a much, much tougher environment for much of the emerging world than we've had for many years. Do you share that pessimism, and do you <clears throat> think the emerging world is prepared for it? Um, certainly, the, the last decade was a very benign decade for <clears throat> the low-income commodity exporters, the frontier economies. It was the, the first time they really started to grow, uh, and they had four good things all in the same decade. They started with debt relief, um, then their commodity export prices went up like a train. Um, the rising commodity prices triggered global prospecting, investment in prospecting, and the frontier economies were the least prospected environments on Earth. We think, for example, of Africa as resource-rich. As of the millennium, it was very resource-poor. Per square mile, it had only one-fifth the discoveries of the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So a lot of prospecting in the frontier economies, a lot of discoveries. So as well as high prices, you got new quantities coming on stream. And then, to cap it all, um, the world of wash with liquidity, they were deemed credit worthy, and so they stocked up with debt again. Um, that was a wonderful decade, and they grew. Uh, but it's over. It really is over. Um, the, um, so looking, looking forward, we got, um, really three things that, that, that these countries have to do. Uh, Nigeria kind of exemplifies it. One is they've got to manage the short-term shock of very much reduced uh, export revenues. Um, and uh, will they be able to manage that? Second, the, they need, if at all possible, to reflect on what went wrong during the commodity super cycle. That was their biggest opportunity they've ever had. And to a fair extent, it was a missed opportunity. Now, um, a, a really good test of a society is whether it learns the lessons of mistakes. Germany is the best-run economy in Europe today because it used to be the worst and learned the lessons from it. Um, Argentina has, never, has went through the same macroeconomic crisis as Germany but never learned the right lessons, and so it's repeated them every 10 years for a century. Um, so one is managing the shock, two is do you learn the lessons of the past, and three, fortunately, these frontier economies have a lot of opportunities beyond natural resources. The last decade was a natural resource story. The coming decades are going to be decades of big economic opportunities which they could harness but they're not as obvious as dig it out of the ground and ship it out. Um, well, that's sort of moderately positive, I guess, that there is an opportunity there, but you're also pretty, pretty grim. Um, Anna, when you listen to this, first of all, do you agree with it, uh, this litany of gloom? And secondly, I just want to pick up on something that Willem said. He said that uh, the world is retreating from globalization. Do you think that's true? Well, I, first of all, Yes, there is gloom if you take the vision of yesterday. We, we are looking at a world that has nothing to do with the world the way we used to know it. Actors are not any longer uh, nation states. We have a plethora of actors. And what, more than gloom, what I would say it's a confusion. And it's a confusion because there is an emerging group, uh, world where power is not what it used to be, the distribution of power is not what it used to be, and we don't have yet 
even the directions, and we try to go with our suit of certainty. We want certainty, we want legal security, we want the Washington Consensus. Well, you know, the ugly truth is that this is not any longer here, it's not a possibility, so we better, instead of going on this crisis mode, jumping one, gra one crisis to the other, just say, you know what, today it's governance stupid. It's economy, yes, but it's governance, stupid. And by the way, the new Nobel, Nobel Economy Prize had a very interesting article a couple of years ago that was called um, Weak States, Poor Economy. So th the governance factor. As I say, I'm not, I don't think it's gloom, is that we have to look at the world with a different lens. And we don't, we can't just look for certainty, and if we don't find certainty, say, it's a disaster, you know, there is chaos, there is gloom. No, uh, there, is, there cannot be certainty because there is a mutation here. What we have to look is certain predictability, trends, but instead of strategizing, instead of looking into the future, we stick in just looking with the old eyes, and frankly, I end up with this idea of, of protectionism. Well, you know, yes and no. TPP is there, and TPP is not protectionist. There will be reactions by China, but there, there is a new emergence of a different world where soft legislation, self-regulation, for a lawyer than I am, this means, you know, mm, I don't like it. I like hard law. So, and you, as, as investors, as economic actors, you want to have legal security, legal order, good governance, but you know what? The issue is there. And I'm not pessimistic. I think that instead of trying to, or not trying, of being reactive and trying to just keep the old models, let's look at what is emerging and let's just see what the trends are and where we can find this governance for the world. Let me, that's very extremely interesting, but let, let me push you a little bit on that. I mean, we are moving away from the old world, but what exactly is, what at least are the broad outlines of the new world? And, and let me perhaps <coughs> challenge you on two. I mean, one narrative that was very popular and has been for a long time is that the, you know, the advanced world was going to be slow growing, aging populations, the dynamism in the world economy was going to come from the emerging world. The emerging world was going to pick up where, and that seems to be being questioned by these, these trends that the three of you have described. And politically, another narrative was, you know, the US sole superpower was being challenged, and that seems to be happening, but being challenged on many different fronts in ways that we're, we're seeing right now. Well, you know, uh, the, I mean, the decline of the United States has been predicted, the rise of the BRICS. BRICS were going to just replace the United States at the hell of the responsibilities in the world. I'm not speaking exclusively economics because you know what? There is more than economics. And the truth of the matter is that nobody has replaced yet the United States, and it's not going to replace it uh, in the short run. run. And I know that this is a bit provocative, but BRICS is a fallacy. And, and you know, I'm quoting myself. It's not a, but it is. I mean, in the sense that I mean, there is no appetite by the BRICS to jump to the responsibilities of just been prom promoting this global governance. And you know, the United States is still there. And Europe, old, aging, I mean, messy, uh, just, uh, I mean, cranky, everything. But we, we are still there. And we are still contributing, and contributing a lot. So frankly, I'm not pessimistic. I think that it's a, it's a bit of a mess. But it's a mess because there is a new world, and a world where the United States has its role, different, European Union has its role, and of course, of course, the BRICS and other actors, other actors that are not state, because this is, I mean, from Daesh to multinationals, to NGOs, to individuals, this guy that suddenly put the price of a, of a drug 700 times, I mean, he just shook the world. And it was just one guy with a, or, or Snowden. You know, this, this is a new world where you can shake the world structure by being Snowden.
Thank you very much. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's drill down into bits of that, and let's start, since we are in Europe, with Europe. Willem, old, aging, cranky Europe, but it still plays its role. Is Europe playing its role, economically and politically? No, Europe is a politically a lightweight. It doesn't even address you know, incredible tragedies on its own borders, which will come to visit, are coming, have come to visit it. Um, Europe uh, politically doesn't exist. Right? Economically, it's a rich place. Um, uh, we have uh, certain institutions uh, that um, provide something that suspiciously resembles the rule of law. So that is unusual, right? Very few countries in other parts of the world have that. Mostly it's the rule of lawyers, uh, but uh, which is not the same thing. And um, uh, so uh, Europe has not provided, and is incapable of providing leadership until it decides to act uh, you know, in, a, in a collective way, and it doesn't. Um, so uh, there are opportunities. I think the um, fact that Europe is surrounded by regions with a young, highly mobile, you know, iPhone-equipped generation means that uh, the uh, immigration that is necessary to revitalize this otherwise, I think, stagnant and aging continent is bound to be coming, regardless of the conflict. I mean, it's accelerated at the moment because of this, uh, because of the Middle East falling apart. But uh, even with, if peace were to break out, right, the, the millions will be coming from the Maghreb, from, uh, in, well, from the Sahel region, other parts of Africa, Middle East, because nature abhors a vacuum. Right? An old, rich, youth-deficient region will always attract um, you know, uh, uh, people from bordering regions with easy access, right? um, thousands of miles of either land border or relatively easy water borders. So I think the, the, the immigration issue is Europe's one chance, I think, to revitalize itself. It will be enormously difficult, but it's the only chance for Europe uh, to, uh, if it tackles that problem well, collectively, of playing a role in the world again. Otherwise, we'll become the Greece of the Roman Empire. Well, for just one sentence, if you allow yes, me. Sure. Well, Europe is work in progress. I agree with you. Collectively, we could do more. But let me just counter example. The Iran agreement. The Iran agreement has been pushed by the Europeans, and the Europeans have played a key role there. So, I mean, honestly, I, I understand that this is one example. There should be many more, but you know, this is work in progress. If the European contribution uh, to uh, the deal with Iran uh, is what justifies uh, describing it as, a, as playing a role, then uh, your hurdle is very low. Let's, this let's, was the United States. Let's, let's and leave China Iran. And Russia I, Iran is extremely that important. That but let's, let's Europe played no role. Let's return no. to the uh, the top, the subject of migrants, um, and I want to turn to you, Paul, because you have written uh, a lot and provocatively about migrants. So, do you agree with Willem that um, the the migrants, the increasing immigration, is Europe's one shot at uh, creating a vibrant continent? No, I don't really. Um, the um, it's dangerous to disagree with Will, yeah, no, but let me have a go. Um, the, um, there's, a, there's a brilliant new book on globalization by a, an economist, Richard Baldwin, who's a very leading international trade economist. Um, and um, he concludes by saying, what, a, what is the most important thing a government can do to position its, its country uh, successfully in, the, in the, the globalization race. Uh, and he considers nine different things, many of them very conventional, like um, subsidize innovation, um, uh, encourage investment, encourage human capital. He considers nine things. Top of the pile, the most important thing a country can do is build social capital. Now, that is actually Europe's big advantage. Europe has a lot of social capital, not at the level of Europe, but the, at the levels of the nations of Europe. The nations of Europe 
uh, benefited, especially coming out of the Second World War, with what you might call inclusive nationalism. What we've now got masquerading as nationalism is not nationalism, it's divisions. It's one group claiming the flag and saying, we're the nation and you're not. But coming out of the, first, of the Second World War was a phase of inclusive nationalism, which built Europe's socially inclusive institutions, the welfare state and so on. All these institutions got built after the Second World War around the nations of Europe on the back of a sense of shared identity. Uh, what uh, mass immigration would threaten is indeed that sense of shared identity. So, so do you think what is happening now threatens the very nature of Europe? That's too exaggerated, right? But it, it's, um, I'm a it's, if it's a, yes, yeah, but, but I'm not. Um, uh, and so um, uh, if the task is build social capital, and Europe at the moment has the strongest social capital in the world, markedly stronger than America, um, is migration going to contribute to social capital or weaken social capital? Probably weaken it. That's very interesting. So, Larry, you hear two very different perspectives here. Where do you stand on this? So, I think uh, leadership usually comes uh, from behind, not from in front. Um, leadership doesn't come, it seems to me, typically uh, when there is uh, when times are good, but when challenges are present. Um, one thinks that the United States is utterly abdicating its role of leader, but in the interwar period, it was only the adversity of the Second World War and then the Cold War that promoted it into this more internationalist phase that it has been in for the last 70 odd years. So for Europe to have been a leader it was probably never going to happen over most of that period of time. It was rebuilding itself and generating obviously the kind of social capital, some might call it the welfare state that has served it I think in many ways so well over this period of time. But in small ways now Europe is facing the adversity that I think will promote some leadership. Um, TPP is one thing, it's probably gonna force Europe now to, to find its companion agreement in the transatlantic uh, uh, way, at least it will force pressures in that particular direction. The uh, crisis on its borders, that is a, the Syrian crisis, but more generally the crisis to the uh, south and to the east of, of, uh, of Europe, but also perhaps the crisis immediately to its east, is going to promote also a rethink about strategies to cope with it. And I think you can see it in Angela Merkel's response, which is extraordinarily brave and bold, and, and I would say for the most part principled about letting immigrants in. She may have to modify that. There are already some steps to do so. But I think it represents signs that Europe can actually rise to the occasion, but it has to face adversity first. And I think in various ways, it is beginning to do so. Lastly, I would sort of say with result, perhaps also with an eye towards the Iranian agreement, is that the revolution, uh, if one wants to call it that, in, in the production of energy is also, I think, going to put Europe in a position where it has to step forward. It has to find its own energy solutions within its borders, but it also has to at least confront the possibility that the United States will no longer be the guarantor of energy coming out of the Middle East, and that will put pressure on Europe to respond in, in whatever way, and we don't know how it's going to respond. So I think these pressures that we now bemoan are actually probably the sources of the leadership that will come. Anna, do you, do you see that? Do you, do you, you, you've, you've been in these kind of positions. Is adversity uh, the, what, what pushes politicians towards leadership? And how do you assess, uh, let's, particularly Angela Merkel's approach, because she's clearly taken a very different approach on the euro than she has on the, on the migration. Well, you know, I'm less enthusiastic. I think that in Angela Merkel's key decision, which is to suspend the legal framework, the, what is technically Dublin, uh, there is, I would say, and I said it yesterday, 50% of generosity and of leadership, and it will have a fantastic effect because it, she has shaken the boat. And an area where the old approach of sovereignty is really entrenched, when you really, you don't, nobody, nobody wanted to let these uh, home affairs issues go uh, to the, into the European realm, I mean, it will happen. Now it's going to happen, and I fully agree. I mean, Monet used to say, Europe will be built from crisis to crisis, and there is truth there, because when there is not the push of a crisis, you know, well, in enthusiasm slows, and we have had that with uh, the Greek crisis. There were certain measures that were taken because of the Greek crisis, but now, the, now everything has slowed down. <laughs> we need this impetus. So, uh, 
there is another aspect of Angela Merkel is that you cannot do that just from one day to the to I mean, announce it. It seems that it was a mistake. I don't know. But the effect is that she has created a, a, an unwanted effect in the European Union of division of uh, just Hungary and the Czech, especially the, the new uh, European countries, but also I mean, the country I know best in the European jargon, Spain. For me, uh, we, we also we think that this is having consequences that even in Germany they are going to to be, I mean, there is going to be a certain backlash and it's going to be difficult to tackle at the European Council level. So I fully agree that we need for to push forward we historically and as I say I'm quoting Monet. No, uh, so we need this this crisis. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned about where we are because what I think is that for the first time there is a pervasive impression that the European Union construction is not irreversible. And this is new. Mm -hmm. This did not happen because until now we had the Eurosceptics in certain places more numerous than in others and, and some, I mean, some marginal that would say, well, this is not reversible and we want to reverse it. But the bulk, and today, even in Brussels, the buzz of the day is, huh, is this really reversible? And that's an issue. One very important factor that would accelerate that perception that the European Union is not reversed, irreversible is, of course, if Britain chose to leave. And you, you yeah. mentioned that earlier. Do, do, do come back to migrants if you like, too. But I'd also then like you to address what you, what you think the odds are of a Brexit and well, what the, the consequences the would be. The odds are Could I just disagree with Paul on uh, this notion of social capital? Yes, there is a, a tribal approach to social capital. But there's also a civic approach to social capital. And um, Europe, uh, in the first half of the 20th century, almost destroyed itself. Right, by creating two world wars, um, Nazism, fascism, and trying to annihilate Jewry. And um, uh, then it behaved itself for two generations uh, as it rebuilt itself from the, the ashes of a continent. And it did so quite well. Uh, the divisions, of course, even before <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, 19th, uh, the 20th century were massive within the so-called nation-states, class divisions has always been much more divisive than race, ethnicity, or even religious divisions. And, uh, they, uh, but after the horrors of, of World War II and I and two, I think we, we were civilized for a while. And now we are back at a stage that we have to rethink what it means to be a citizen, right? And if you're base citizen, on the residency, citizenship of the residence of your ancestors rather than the willingness to play by certain rules and that's the common values, then I think the continent is lost, right? So I very much, basically, a, Europe without immigrants becomes a stagnant and boring continent. Homogeneity, right, is boring and it is not creative, right? London is the most creative place in Europe, probably. And that is because, you know, um, the only language you don't hear is English, right? Uh, and at least not the way it's supposed to be spoken. So, um, <laughs> and uh, uh, that I think is great. And I want to see more of it. Yes, it's complicated. Yes, it's a mess. Yes, trust, the essence of social capital, takes time to build. But given the alternative of uh, you know, people locking themselves into ever tinier units, right? Because the nation states, of course, are disintegrating as well. Uh, the UK almost lost Scotland. They still may. If there is a Brexit, which I think, still think won't happen, but is a material risk, then within you know, two weeks of Britain leaving the EU, Scotland will have uh, another referendum to leave the UK. They will leave. Wales, Northern Ireland will split off, and it will be silly little England sitting there. And I hope at that point that Greater London inside the M25 will secede from England <laughs> and, and rejoin the yeah. EU. But, but, <laughs> 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 but it's... It, 
it's that's a, you link them very well because the, the the very let's say nationalist view of social capital that you were describing yeah. is precisely one of the things that is motivating people who want to be out who want a Brexit. Yeah. I mean, they feel that the notion of England for English people is being undermined by unlimited immigration. So, Paul. Uh, this is the, we're going to get focused on this for a while because I think this is very key, not just to the Brexit debate, not just to mm -hmm. the future of Europe, but more broadly right now. You have similar debates going on, frankly, in the US. What is, you, you mention, you, you make an argument that social capital is Europe's great advantage and you use it to explain why there shouldn't be so much, I mean, I'm putting these words into your mouth, but why there shouldn't be so much immigration. Isn't Willem right that if Europe doesn't do that, it has a huge demographic problem, it becomes an aging museum, it is unable to stop this anyway, and it, falls, it, it loses what it is to be European? I think, first of all, let me clarify. I'm, I'm, obviously, you don't want identity based on ethnicity. Obviously. Um, I, uh, you want identity based upon shared values. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a rate of immigration at which you can maintain shared values. Mm -hmm. um, migration left to itself would tend to accelerate. Yeah. Um, and there's a risk that as that happens, you start to undermine shared values. Is, is Europe um, at the pace where that is happening? Is I the don't. current pace of migration that, is I that threatened? I, I don't know. What, I, what, what, what we do know is that migration left to itself tends to accelerate for very simple reasons, that diasporas build and they make migration easier. So um, at some stage, migration accelerates to the point at which uh, shared values uh, do potentially become threatened. I mean, the, the, um, and, um, the, the specter of um, going back to uh, Europe, warfare between European nations um, and the European Union as the defense against that um, really just won't s stand up to scrutiny. Yugoslavia? There's been a big sea change in the world, <laughs> attitude, in, certainly in Europe's attitude towards violence. Um, long term, very long term. There's been hundreds and hundreds of years of declines in violence. Um, the, give, or, uh, give or take World War I and II. Uh, even, even allowing World War I and II, the 20th century uh, was less murderous than the 19th and so on and so forth, yeah, yeah. right? But um, let, let, me take, let me give you this test. Um, uh, Boy. Germany, before the Second World War, invaded both Norway and Poland. Right? Um, Poland is in the European community and in the Euro. Norway is not in the European Poland community. Poland is not in the Euro. Sorry, okay, we'll take, we'll take one where it did invade and, sorry. Mm -hmm. You've got, my point is that is Germany any more likely to invade Norway, which yeah. is not in the Euro, not in the European Commission, than anywhere else? Germany's not going to invade anybody ever again, right? Um, Germany is pro-European community because there's been a sea change in attitudes coming out of that searing experience of conflict. The institutions follow the change in values, not the other way around. I think we're going to, I'm going to switch now to the US, not because I think Europe is extremely interesting, but I think we should stick probably more in the here and now and look forward because we haven't, we haven't focused very much on the United States role in some, and some of these debates particularly about the nature of immigration, are very live in the US too. Do you, you know, we're looking forward now to 2016. Uh, we're looking, if you, if you look at the US political debate um, on the two sides, it's quite hard to be terribly optimistic about what's going on. Give us a sense of, is, where do you think the US is going? You were very upbeat about the US economy. Why is there this dissonance between the performance of the US economy and the nature of the US political debate? Okay, uh, first maybe just a word on immigration with respect <laughs> right. to the US, if I, if I may. I mean, I think the US also has very much abdicated any kind of a, of a, of a let's say, uh, a justifiable position on immigration, not just because it has a massive wall on its southern border, but uh, post 9-11, as Mike Milken pointed out in his breakfast yesterday, for those of you who might have been there, 
U.S. tightened up uh, rules on, on the types of people you really do want to come to your country, the, the best educated people to pursue higher education, uh, and generally ask those people to leave once they have achieved their degrees, which is surely throwing away vast pools of talent. So certainly when we're thinking about leadership in that area, I think the United States has a lot of homework to do. Coming back to your question, though, um, well, the way I sort of think about this rise of populism, is I think that's what you're really driving at, um, and this is not exclusive to the United States, it's elsewhere, is this that the, the, the financial crisis and the ensuing Great Recession, which was truly great in any respect, um, uh, didn't produce actually initially that much populism. And I think one of the reasons why is that we had a sort of readily identifiable culprit uh, that politicians, the media, and the public uh, could essentially chastise, and it took that some emotional venting out of it. It was called the bankers, right? It was the, all the bankers' fault, which to some extent it surely was. Um, and so that sort of su served essentially as the outlet for these emotive um, responses. But that's run its course. Um, and unfortunately, the malaise to, in, for many people has not. You know, I've mentioned in earlier remarks the disparities of income, um, which are there between capital and labor, as I highlighted, but obviously are particularly acute amongst people of lower skills uh, with fewer chances to, f to find uh, decent uh, work and so forth. And now we're seeing, I would say, the successive wave, uh, waves of populism. Still hasn't taken its toll in an area that it did in the 30s, that is in terms of protectionism. We haven't advanced much on that agenda except until very recently, but at least we haven't really gone backwards. But I think it is now manifesting itself in the ways that we've just been discussing, against immigrants, for example, um, but also uh, against politics as usual. And I think even though say in the U.S., I think we're at some kind of an inflection point in terms of the economy and the disparities of income. Problem is, is that the politics won't change with the inflection point. There'll be a long lag between improvements in economic conditions and their broad recognition in the public and their manifestation in the debate. So I, I'm afraid this issue will be with us for longer. And do you think the consequences um, come next November of this uh, populist surge will be manifest in the election outcome? Or are we now seeing you know, potential candidates on both sides who will ultimately be replaced by more establishment candidates. Uh, economic forecasting is bad enough, which is what I do as a profession. Political <laughs> forecasting is much worse. So I certainly wouldn't venture here, I, I guess, as to who is going to win, both in terms of the presidency or in terms of other electoral offices and the composition of them. But I think it's already left its mark. Yeah. In other words, I think it's changed the debate, not necessarily for the better in the United States. I think it'll be more difficult to enact what I would say are forward-looking, progressive, um, globalization-oriented policies in the United mm -hmm. States simply because these issues have been now raised and there has to be a political response. And we can see it on both the left. You alluded to Bernie Sanders and the way in which Hillary Clinton has had to tack in that direction, uh, and also, of course, in the Republican Party as well. Um, Anna, do you agree with that? Do you think that the popular, and this is true perhaps on both sides of the Atlantic, that the disaffection with the establishment, the populist rise is affecting policies and will continue to do so? Well, I think that absolutely populism is soft policies that affect hard, the hard core of our constitution in the, the constitutional sense. So I, I agree. I think that in United States, what seen from the outside is important is that the two, I mean, energies will go to this internal debate an internal debate that is, uh, I mean, is taking, because of this race of populism there and this specificity of populism in the United States, is not very enlightening, but it will take the energies of the country, the energies to project or to concentrate on other issues. And frankly, I mean, I'm a died to the wool Atlanticist, and I think that this is not good news for the world in 2016. There's just, I uh, mean, United States looking into its navel of uh, Trumps and, and other side. Populism. Populism is, as I, as I said before, in my opinion, it's nostalgia and it's nostalgia because of insecurity and it's insecurity because of not understanding where the world goes. And frankly, if I miss something, 
in this side of the Atlantic, because the United States has a big advantage, is that the American dream may not be any longer but a dream. But the truth of the matter is that it still works as a narrative, as a reference. And people want to become Americans and to, in, to be included in this, just in this flow, in this narrative. We don't have that in Europe. If I had to identify one issue, is that the world in the end is moved by big ideas. And big ideas was the, the fight for, for civil rights in the United States. The Cold War was a big idea in the sense that it was a big existential threat. The Europe, Europe was a big idea. It's not any longer. There is no powerful narrative there. And, and therefore, I mean, just it's, it's understandable that citizens turn to someone and say, well, here I have a fantastic narrative that explains everything, that just finds the right culprits, and that gives you a way out and just go back to the all good days. But you're, that, that's not realistic, but it's there. And in the United States, you know, unfortunately, in that sense, United States is going European, which is not the good news. In the absence of a big idea, you mean? Yeah, in yeah. the presence, when you listen to the debate, yeah. You think, I mean, this is not my United States. This is just uh, any European debate. The, the level, the, I mean, the thrust of this debate. In that sense, I think that there is a danger. Please don't go European in that sense. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's move from this um, very wide ranging and still, I fear, somewhat depressing analysis <laughs> to uh, some prescriptions. Willem, if you were running the world, which is a uh, a, um, I am, I am. Well, <laughs> <laughs> what, and, and you combine this rather febrile and populist political environment, the mm -hmm. challenges um, that, that you and, and Paul discussed, and the slowing economy that you spoke about at the beginning. What is left in the toolkit? What should be the right policy response? What should politicians be doing? Well, it, it, so immediate to get economic activity going, pretty obvious. Um, Helicopter money in any country slowing down and having too low inflation, intelligently targeted uh, in terms of the spending or tax cuts, uh, depending on the circumstances. The money to U.S. Contact. infrastructure, you know, other con China consumption, all that. But beyond that, I think in in the advanced countries, we have to deal with this one of the roots of this polarization and internal division that takes up, and that is the growing inequality. Right? And uh, I don't want to sound like Piketty, but this really is a, is a problem. Um, the, in the United States, for instance, which has a political system that requires consensus to function. There's so many checks and balances between the branches of government, federal and state, that there are too many veto groups if there is no consensus. The consensus is gone, and it's a miracle if anybody manages to switch on the light in the morning. Right? And, but I really don't know how the TPA and the TPP actually passed. I think this is great and wonderful, but it was against all odds. And the TPP inability... hasn't passed yet. Sorry? TPA? TPA has, Yeah, yes. but the TPP, I mean, it's got to the point that, yes. it, that will be passed in the US at any rate. Canada is more of a problem, but yeah. Okay, uh, that was remarkable it got that far. But for the rest, it's been paralysis. And, to, and this is because it reflects a deeper polarization society. You have Republican neighborhoods now, Democratic neighborhoods. Um, uh, labor capital inequality within labor distribution. It's increasingly a winner takes all um, a form of remuneration. And so I think we have to, really have to rethink, um, especially now that um, you know, robotics and artificial intelligence are likely to take over a lot of jobs that previously made for a reasonably well, well paid working class. We're going to have to think seriously about. Uh, um, you know, uh, something like the only thing that Friedman and Tobin agreed on, right? The negative income tax or the uh, guaranteed minimum income as a basis for uh, participation in a society. Uh, this, of course, makes immigration uh, all the more attractive in those countries that have it. But yeah, we would have some waiting list for that. But yeah, I think unless we address this fundamental link of uh, problem of polarization and inequality, uh, we're going to have increasing divisions internal debate, paralysis, and a very unpleasant society. So much bolder prescriptions, whether it's helicopter yeah. money, whether it's basic minimum income. Paul, yeah. do you agree with that? And what would your top of your to-do list be? 
Yeah, I do. I do agree with it. Um, I think the, uh, the it comes back to the point about social capital that inequality is is eroding social capital, and the erosion of social capital is encouraging the is permitting the inequality. Um, the countries I work on um, have a here and now problem and a longer term opportunity. And the here and now problem is managing a big negative shock. Take Nigeria as an example. 70% um, of Nigeria's revenues, government revenues are oil, and its oil rents have collapsed by more than half. Um, uh, nearly all its export earnings are oil, and again, it's collapsed by more than half. Um, so it's got very big adjustments to make uh, fiscally and uh, on the uh, import side. There's a right way to do that and there's a wrong way to do it. The right way to do it in Nigeria will be dead easy. Uh, Non-oil tax receipts are only 3% of GDP. So you need to put up non-oil taxation mm -hmm. and you stop spending on the scams. Um, so the fiscal adjustment should be easy. It's economically easy, it's not politically easy. You know? And that's the challenge. Watch that space, what's happening on the fiscal adjustment. Similarly, on the exchange rate, on the, on the foreign exchange. The temptation is to go back to the 1980s and ration foreign exchange. That way lies the whole rigmarole of grotesque economic inefficiency, but even more grotesque um, rent seeking right. as foreign exchange gets allocated. Those are the two things to watch. Is it taken by taxation? Uh, is it taken by, by devaluation? It needs to be. Or is the can just going to be kipped down the road with uh, borrowing domestically and abroad? But so, so both the, the, the low-income countries that you're focusing on and the, the, the developed countries that, that Willem was particularly focusing on, the the prescriptions that you have are perhaps technically more within the standard conventional toolkit, but the politics is as difficult in both places. Oh, to incredibly do this. complicated. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's child's work in terms of writing it down, implementing it, ha. Huh. <laughs> child's work, what needs to be done in terms of writing it down, politically difficult to implement? Uh, probably, yes. But uh, in terms of my prescription, I, I, I would say that they're picking up on things that were said to my right and to my left. I would say the prescription is a narrative of opportunity. Um, there is plenty of opportunity out there. I'll give a concrete example in a moment, but I think that has to be the narrative that, uh, that people are really focused on because what the world lacks right now is a sense that the future will be better than the present mm -hmm. and to some extent even than the past. And that would evoke in an economic sense anim animal spirits, greater investment and probably also more consumption, all the things that the world is crying out for. So what would be the specific prescription? I would invite uh, leaders of the world uh, to take take a walk, put on their trainers, and walk from Hackney to Tottenham Court Road, and see what the construction of Crossrail rail can do to revitalize parts of London in an amazing way. The multiplier effects of that public inf investment project are enormous. Think about trains that would link New York to its airports. Think about trains that would alleviate the traffic congestion in uh, Beijing, not to mention, obviously, <laughs> the air pollution. The opportunities are replete. We live in a world of excess savings and very low interest rates. Mm -hmm. And governments are doing us a massive disservice by not borrowing as much as they possibly can where they are able to do so to invest in these opportunities. Yeah. That's a terrific I point. Well, Anna, what would you be your prescription? Well, just picking up on what you were saying, I think that we have to understand that infrastructure are, are essential. I used to shock my colleagues at the World Bank when they would just insist on legal empowerment of the poor. I would say, give the poor access to the markets and they will empower themselves. I think that this is absolutely right. We need to focus on this infrastructure. And by the way, the Chinese bank Focusing on infrastructure has picked it up. My, I don't have a prescription, frankly. I, what I see is that there is a growing awareness that we cannot use old recipes and that the world is changing and there is a new emerging world. And there are two areas where this is very clear. The awareness is there, which is good news. One is health. After the Ebola crisis, there is a pervasive 
just understanding that this is common, that we have to tackle it in common. Mm -hmm. We haven't yet fine-tuned the instruments, but we know. The second is climate change. I'm very hopeful that in Paris, we, we will get m more, but what we already have is that there is once more a pervasive awareness that this is a common issue. I remember my first day at the World Bank, it was very hot, in, and I called the, you know, the, the heating central, uh, and the response was, ma'am, open your window. I said, well, but can't it be just saved? I mean, can you lower the temperature? Open your window, ma'am. And we Europeans used to, to travel to the United States with a cashmere sweater in, in summer to go everywhere yeah. because it was freezing. And, you know, like an onion in winter because you couldn't stand the heating anywhere. Now all this is over. Uh, United yeah, States, when true. there is this ingenuity, you have taken the yeah. front line on this climate change. And honestly, I think that there we don't have the instruments yet, but we are getting there. That is a very good, upbeat note on which to end a rather <laughs> bracing and, I'm afraid, slightly downbeat panel, but we've certainly given you plenty of food for thought for the next couple of days. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.